Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So today's lecture is about the history of central banks and the philosophies which guide the actions of central banks. So there are some periods uh, starting from early times. The nature and function of central banking has changed and we will look at these. So very early in the 17th century, uh, there was a cluster of exchange banks. These were banks in um, different uh, trading centers and the basic purpose of these banks were that uh, people could trade across countries without having to carry money with them. They would be able to transfer money from their bank to overseas to buy things from or to other countries to buy things without having to go and without having to carry money which would be a risky transaction. So these so called exchange banks, so uh, these were allowed people to send money and to bring back money. These eventually became central banks and we will use the term uh, high finance which is also called haute finance or French and this has been called uh, the money lenders. So these were uh, very powerful institutions because they had access to a huge amount of money. So I'm going to teach you today about the Bank of England, which is the mother of all central banks, which was formed in 1694. This is a very strange and interesting story, very few people know. First, in 1600, uh, money lenders were driven out of England and out of m most places. Queen Elizabeth, uh, basically the money lenders were um, uh, in a way in control of the money supply because they would be able to uh, provide gold to anybody who wanted. So, uh, by providing these loans, they created the money supply. So they were uh, driven out and Queen Elizabeth actually issued uh, metal coins which were uh, made of metal which was itself worthless or worth very little and she said that this is legal tender. All other coins were cancelled that you have, uh, you can't use any other coin. This action was challenged in the courts and the court ruled that it was the sovereign's right to create money and nobody else had that right. So they supported Queen Elizabeth uh, and it was treason for anyone else to create it. But the merchant classes, uh, the goldsmiths and the financiers, they uh, did not like this at all because the privilege of money creation was taken away from them. So basically they worked to get rid of this. So one way to do this was that um, they funded uh, revolts against the kings and in particular the Cromwell succeeded in carrying out a successful revolution which was financed by these money lenders. The money lenders gave the uh, loan to the parliament. Cromwell, basically it was a battle between the uh, king and the uh, upper classes who were in the parliament. And this has always been the case that the kings uh, are against the upper classes because the upper classes are, are, are always trying to take the kingship away from him. And so the king has a natural alliance with the poor. And that is why um, attempts at privatization, the so-called commons, uh, this was large amounts of forests and rivers and lakes which were uh, common property, everybody could use them. And for a long time, aristocrats had been wanting to acquire this. So this is our own personal right, our, our, the whole village belongs to us and the kings had prevented this from happening because they did not want more power being given to the aristocrats. But anyway, 
so the money lenders exploited this uh, natural split and they funded uh, they provided financing to the parliament uh, for in return for two conditions that the loans would be guaranteed they would receive repayment for them and that the financiers would be allowed to operate once again when they had been banned so um cromwell carried out a successful uh, um revolution and then charles was actually captured and uh, the king uh, and tried and executed so that he would not to make sure that he doesn't return to power because if he had come to power then he would have um, not allowed all of this to happen so after cromwell died there was no particular head of that revolution which had been launched so the um, parliament uh, and the um, financiers offered to give him back the kingship but in the process uh, they made sure that uh his hands would be tied in many different ways one of the things was that the privilege of issuing money was uh given to the parliament as well as the taxation privilege uh there was the free coinage act of 1666 which meant that anybody who brought in gold or silver uh to the mint that would be converted into money so that anybody could create money out of the um, gold and silver this was a very powerful instrument because basically it gave the power of uh, money creation to the private sector and of course uh, it's only to the rich that it makes a difference so uh, king william 3 is an important um, figure in this he started out as a dutch aristocrat the most powerful of the exchange banks was the um, amsterdam wissel bank and this was the one which financed king william dutch money lenders uh first they arranged his marriage to prince mary princess mary of york then james was removed from power and william and mary became the joint rulers in 1689 and then uh soon there was the nine years war with uh, france for this purpose he needed uh, money which he got in return for giving creating the bank of england uh so basically english england was defeated by france which who had the bigger navy in 1690 and so england had to borrow money in order to build a man, new uh new um navy but king william had no money and so it could not borrow the 1.2 million pounds that they wanted basically the powers of the king at that point were through the parliament in order to raise this he would have had to put in taxes and that was not really feasible and the parliament was not uh very much uh going along with him in fact it denied him funds when he asked them the bank of england was formed to provide 1.2 million pounds to the king to allow him to carry out this war and how this was done this is very important to understand he said that okay um we are going to form a company which is the governor and company of the bank of england the uh, anybody who is a stockholder in this company basically you buy stocks in this company that is the money that the king will get so that's the loan and anybody who buys stocks he will earn the 8% return that the king is offering actually there was um, so now um so far so good but uh, the bank that is going to be created will be allowed to issue money uh basically uh they said okay you give us paper saying that i owe you the king will give us a paper i owe you 1.2 million pounds and i promise to pay 8% per annum on it and uh the bank said that you don't have to pay it back yani all you do is you pay me the 8% uh 
and also uh, you don't need to raise 8% I will do it on your behalf by collecting taxes so but ha huh, the, the key thing is that this money this IOU of the government I will be able to write notes on it. I will say this. I have 1.2 million pounds of the king's money, and I can use this as notes to do whatever I want. So, if I say that okay, I have 1 million pounds here, I'm going to buy this company. Here are my notes. What is this note? This note is an IOU by the king. So actually, it was not the IOU by the king, but it was a note which was backed by the IOU of the king. So basically, they got the money. Uh, this is called monetization of the debt. They got the power to create money. The money, the money that was created was backed by the word of the king. That was all. So these ba Bank of England would issue bank notes that would circulate as the national paper currency. The bank, no uh, bank would create bank notes out of nothing, and um, only a fraction of them would be backed by gold. Actually. Uh, but basically, it would mainly be backed by the government IOU. Now, so if you circulate these notes and um, people say that, okay, give me, um, I want to get gold. Well, it's not technically backed by gold, but the uh, but it's backed by a king's promise to pay gold. So it should have some value. So the bank said that, okay, yes, we will redeem these notes in gold. So... Um, even though it's backed by the king's IOU, the king doesn't have money, but we will uh, act as the intermediary. That is what, what is meant. You see, the king, technically what happened was, wh what should have happened was that the banks gave 1.2 million gold to the king, but they did not. They just said, okay, wh whenever you need, we will give you the gold as required. So now they have, they have 1.2 million pounds and they have promised to redeem this debt for gold as required. So whenever somebody came in and said, okay, I want to get gold for this pound, they would give him the gold. But they didn't need as much gold as 1.2 million pounds because if people are confident that the gold is there, then they don't demand it. The lenders would be allowed to secure payment on the national debt by direct taxation of the people. So the 8%, not the principal 1.2 million, but the 8% per annum that was due that they collected by putting taxes on the people and goods. So this is the model in which most central banks have been based. It was privately owned by stockholders from its foundation in 1694 until it was nationalized in, in 1946. So basically the Bank of England, which seemed to everybody to be a government bank, is actually owned by financiers. It's not owned by the government of England. And this is the case for most central banks. So, how did the Bank of England provide one point? Did they have 1.2 million pounds in gold? No, actually, what, what is very strange, if you think about it technically, is uh, it, it makes no sense. I mean, your head becomes very puzzled. The Bank of the King uh, writes an IOU to the Bank of England saying that I owe you 1.2 million dollars and now the bank prints 1.2 million pounds as uh, in bank notes which are backed by this uh, IOU and these uh, he says okay here's your 1.2 million pounds so basically the uh, bank is providing the money that the king the king uh, on the basis of the IOU that the king so basically it's giving back to the king what the king gave to uh, the bank it's a very puzzling transaction but uh, we will see why this how this happened so now the bank provided bullion so as needed I will provide you gold this is part of the uh, but not 1.2 million gold bars to sit in your castle uh, gold bars are with me, but I will provide them as needed. So technically, the king can ask for 1.2 million in gold, but the king doesn't want 1.2 million in gold. He wants to make sure that any payments that he makes are honored. So the bank now, the king can write checks or can give these notes. As these notes have the property that, in principle, 
anybody can take these notes to the bank and get gold for them. So this is something that the king cannot do. King does not have any gold, but the bank can. So that's why uh, this trade can be done. It is now authorized to issue currency backed by gold or by government debt. It can redeem the liability of the government. This is how modern state bank works. The government writes a check and anybody can present it to the central bank and the central bank will cash it uh, by, actually of course there is no gold involved anymore, but it will de provide, uh, deposit uh, an electronic entry in your bank account if you if you present it with the government obligation. And it can also collect taxes on behalf of the government if uh, the government owes the bank. So this is not true anymore for our banks. So uh, the central bank was established at the end of 16th century, uh, 17th century and uh, basically over the period in 1800 actually the Bank of France was established and then uh, basically all of the European powers acquired these central banks over this period of the uh, 19th century and this became what was known as high finance and uh, this uh, was a century of unusual peace in Europe, among the European powers, not in the world. In the world there were huge numbers of wars going on, but these were all wars of colonization. The European powers did not fight among themselves. And Karl Polanyi says that this was because the high finance, they had very strong linkages across the capitals and f f it was not in their interests to have wars between the powers. So whenever there was an occasion for war, they uh, exerted their uh, invisible power to make sure that uh, some peace was negotiated. So, um, in this period, in the 19th century, uh, Disraeli said that the world is governed by very different people from what is imagined by those who are not behind the scenes. And Rothschild, who was one of the billionaires and controlled the Bank of England, said, I don't care who is on the throne of England. Uh, the man who controls the money supply controls the empire and I am the man who controls the money supply. Today it's the same thing. The US uh, President Obama made many campaign promises uh, one of them was that he would um, uh, ban guns and he could never do so because the armament lobby is far too strong and uh, similarly he said that there was this outrageous deal negotiated by uh, one of the senators uh, who after uh, he uh, and the deal was this that the Government, the biggest medical care program of government will uh, buy medicines only from U.S. producers <coughs> at whatever price they name. They will not even be allowed to negotiate the prices and they will not be allowed to import. So if they are charge uh, $100 for this drug and it's selling for $10 in Canada, they cannot buy it. So this... Uh, uh, there's been huge and amazing things which have happened like this Daraprim or Daraclor which we sell for malaria which is so cheap that uh, it costs, uh, it used to cost um, ten dollars and now it costs uh, three hundred dollars or something like that and there are many such examples where a very cheap easy to manufacture medicine which is essential for lives has been uh, yani raised to incredible amounts. Actually, insulin. People are dying because they cannot buy insulin. Uh, and the same thing which used to cost, same insulin which used to cost ten dollars is being sold at seven hundred dollars or something like that. So, um, this was the, this is the control of finance. Big Pharma is, uh, is very strong financially and they control the parliament sufficiently to make sure that nothing 
again. So Obama had promised that he would uh, get rid of this bill, but he was unable to do so. So the man who controls the money supply controls the empire. <coughs> So, um, looking at the um, Victorian era, the central banks were, uh, the main function was to provide funding to the government. Um, but in addition, the banks were uh, trying to maintain price stability and exchange rate stability. Uh, <coughs> This was because the um, uh, these multi these these were true multinationals. The financiers they had interests in multiple nations, and so that's why they were trying to prevent wars, and they wanted to make sure that the trade takes place at stable prices, and that uh, prices are stable in each country because that's also important requirement for trade. Now. Um, as we have discussed, this means that the money supply is fixed by international considerations and therefore it cannot adjust to domestic market. So that was no problem, I mean, allowing large amounts of unemployment in the domestic market was also something that was favorable and desirable for these uh, high finance international. So the domestic concerns were sacrificed or in preference for the international concerns. So at that time also there were many um, theorists, uh, Victorian era monetarists, and there were uh, many philosophies about how the central banks should function. One important position was the uh, debate was the bullionist versus anti-bullionist. So the, the bullionists said that the money should be backed by gold and uh, anybody who wants to uh, demand uh, gold for his money should be given gold. The anti bullionists said that no, money should be backed by the uh, real uh, bills, the assets in the economy, not necessarily gold. One of the concerns was uh, of the banks, central banks was to, that the gold standard, how can this be reconciled with financial stability? Uh, <coughs> financial stability may, mainly meant prevention of panics and runs on banks because everybody understood that and the gold standard was actually a fractional reserve standard. There was never 100% reserve. So, uh, in such a situation, panics are always possible, and at any point, in fact, the um, uh, the banks could uh, any any time all the people who had claims on the banks would show up at the same time. The bank would be unable to provide them with the gold because there were just not enough. So one of the tactics that was used by banks was the large old established banks. Uh, they could gang up on new entrants. If there's somebody who has started a bank, because banks was a profitable business, what they could do and what was actually done on occasions was that um, the banks would issue bills and it would, would issue checks and uh, the other big banks would just hold them. And then uh, when they had accumulated enough, they would all, uh, in collaboration, present them to the bank at the same time. And the law said that if you are presented with the... Uh, the law was designed to prevent fractional reserve, actually. It was... And it said that if you get a bill, you must pay it right away. You should not delay. So this would cause the banks to collapse. So then there was a law which was passed saying that uh, you can have a moratorium. You can um, say that, okay, I will pay, but for a certain, uh, after a certain period of time. So this was one of the ways to prevent the panics. Uh, in that time also there were some rules which were made for setting interest rates. It was kind of a prototype of a Taylor rule. 
and uh, Badgett, Badgett rule. Uh, the issue was that the, it was debated that central banks should bail out banks which are in trouble, like if they are under attack. So it was clear to everybody that this bailout should not be given to everybody at all times, otherwise the banks can do anything. On the other hand, it was also clear that sometimes, especially like in this situation where the bank is under attack, the bank is fundamentally sound, but it has been. So in that case, uh, the central bank should step in to bail out. So the rule for when, sh when should you ask uh, act as a lender of last resort was uh, discussed and some guidance was provided. <coughs> So one of the important doctrines which was uh, used to carry out central bank business was the real bills doctrine that uh, basically um, just like you see the bank uh, the initial uh, transaction was that the um, government provided an IOU to the bank and then the bank monetized this debt it would uh, create money on the basis of this. So similarly, the checking account that we use is a monetization of debt. When, uh, the, when um, I deposit money, then the bank, uh, uh, the bank acquires, uh, well not like that, um, when the bank gives a loan to somebody, uh, they create an account for him and in this account they say that any checks that is written by this person or written by somebody else on the basis of what this person receives, we will pay uh, money for. So somebody comes in with a check for a thousand rupees the bank gives them cash which is today's gold now uh, this is a loan so um, <coughs> this cash <coughs> where is it coming from well it is backed by this IOU that the man has promised that he will pay uh, us in the future so on the basis of this promise I am giving uh, money to third parties uh, and the backing of this money is the real bill, the, uh, the promise of this person to pay. So the real bills doctrine says that any asset uh, you can issue money against that, but you should not create money out of nothing. Uh, as opposed to this, <coughs> <coughs> so basically uh, the theory, the real bills doctrine says that if you follow this principle that for every money that you issue you have some uh, real asset backing it uh, then this will not be inflationary but uh, that is actually false theory but this is the reason that in the Great Depression era banks did not undertake expansionary policy because they said well yes obviously economy needs money but where will we get the money from? We have no real assets against which we can issue money. So the real bills doctrine was wrong. Basically it assumes that the full equilibrium or um, so once you are at f uh, full employment equilibrium, all the resources are available. So um, there would always be enough assets that you could issue uh, loans against them. But if you are at unemployment, then you are uh, in trouble because there are real assets which are lying unused. And so... Um, this uh, assumption that there will always be enough real bills to monetize to keep output is uh, false and when there was not enough money to go around then there was deflation prices started falling <coughs> this is the 
debt deflation cycle. <clears throat> so in 1914, so up to 1914, there was this Victorian uh, monetary uh, theories which were used to guide central banks. But in 1940, and real bills doctrine was the main uh, was the mainstream uh, view. But there were opposed people who were um, arguing. In fact, Thornton was an early Keynesian, and he uh, argued that the real bills is wrong and that you can uh, print money. He was like, basically, took a position of Keynes that in a recession you should <coughs> use expansionary monetary policy, you can issue money without any backing. <coughs> so after in 1914 it was clear that the real bills doctrine is not correct, you need more money than can be backed by assets in order to create full employment. So over the period 1914 to 1944 between the two wars there was massive confusion in both philosophy and practice. The central banks were all trying to go back to the gold standard because there was this concept that the uh, gold standard had brought us a huge amount of prosperity. And so the way to get back is to go back to this uh, uh, but now as we have studied uh, the same policies which worked very well in the pre-war period failed to work in the interwar period. And um, we have gone through this in detail. So from the global depression in 29 to the Nixon shock in 71 is uh, an era in which basically in 1929 you had uh, this uh, great crisis. This crisis was caused by basically banking sector expansions in the from 1914 um, to 1918 the um, world war lasted one and basically then after that there was a period of prosperity in the USA because the USA was, uh, had survived uh, without any damage to the uh, economy. And so there was a great boom in demand for their products by Europe, which was completely de devastated by the war. And in addition, there was this uh, uh, plan uh, Marshall Plan, exactly, which was um, uh, said that basically we will provide money to Europe to uh, help them to rebuild. So uh, large amounts, so huge amounts of money f went into Europe, uh, creating a deficit financing boom. And uh, this uh, printing of money also created huge amount of demand for American products, which created a boom in the American economy. And so there you had what was called the Roaring Twenties, where uh, the economy was uh, doing very well. And as we have uh, studied from Minsky, that there was huge amounts of credit creation because the economy was in a boom. So the uh, property values rose and the... Um, real estate prices rose and so there was a lot of stock market rose and so there was lots of people who were ordinary people started investing in stocks by being encouraged. They, they would take loans to invest because they would could make a lot of money. Um, so then there was this collapse and we have now studied why booms collapse. Uh, that's a very important part of the analysis by Minsky that basically the loans uh, that are taken are transformed from hedge loans to speculative loans to Ponzi loans. It sort of happens automatically without um, 
And so once you get into a Ponzi loans, then that's unstable and that can collapse. And once one collapse happens, then that has a effect of uh, uh, multiplying because uh, people are borrowing and then people are these these this this loan, the IOU is being used as a collateral for credit creation. So now once one loan collapses, then a lot of money that was created with the backing of this loan that also collapses. And then that causes further ripple effects. That's why you have this. The bursting occurs very suddenly. So after this bubble burst in the uh, banking crisis, then you had in 1933 the massive regulations uh, came into place. And there was this Glass-Steagall Federal Deposit Insurance, the Fannie Mae, um, corporation this was actually a very important uh, innovation which uh, basically private banks are not equipped to make 30 year loans that's such a long uh, period risk that the private banks cannot afford it so the uh, in order to make this possible the government created an organization which provided guarantees on mortgages so the, the banks uh, could make mortgages and if, as long as they satisfied certain rules, they would get uh, covered by this Fannie Mae, which would ensure them against the possibility of loss. So once this was established, then this allowed the creation of a large amount of credit for the purchase of homes. And this was a, a, a major contributor to prosperity because people can finance homes over a period of 30 years in installments and so um, uh, lots of 30 year loans were given. Banks were restricted to be local, no bank could operate across states. There was an interest rate ceiling to make sure there is no competition among the banks to offer more and more interest. Banking became the most boring profession on the planet. There was the 363 rule. Borrow at 3%, land at 6%, and on the golf course at 3 p.m. Nothing to do. So the boring system is also a very safe system. There were no crises, no efforts by central banks to control crises. Uh, there is this uh, periodization table which shows the crisis frequency. So in the 1945 to 1971 period, you have zero banking crises. This is the post-World War II to the Nixon shock. 71 is exactly Nixon shock. Uh, there were currency crises, exchange rate crises. That happens for different reasons. Twin crisis is when you have both a banking crisis and a currency crisis. So the, basically the key thing is that uh, then there's 73 to 97. 97 is the East Asian crisis. And then, um, okay. So during this period of time, uh, 44 to 71, uh, there was this issue of the central bank, what it is supposed to do, and the treasury, what they are supposed to do. So basically, through trial and error and experiment and experience, these were the general um, uh, rules that were adopted in most places, although there were individual variations from country to country. <coughs> so the treasury was in charge of monetary policy and the central bank was in charge of foreign exchange and implementation of banking regulations and liquidity management, making sure that the government has enough money to spend and uh, handling the debt of the government. And the Treasury uh, established monetary policy. It also established the budget. So how much the debt is going to be? The bank managed the payment of the debt. And fiscal policy, of course, that also needed to be financed. But that was not the central bank role. Uh, and of course, creations of rules and regulations regarding banks. These were jobs of the Treasury implementation of these rules was the central bank job. <coughs> uh, 
So, Nixon shock occurred in 1971. Again, the same dynamic, the war, Vietnam war needed to be financed. And so, um, uh, I think that I have omitted something which is, yeah, just one more slide here. Um, basically, in this period, from 44 to 71, we have Bretton Woods. In 1944, it was, became clear to everybody that um, uh, gold standard cannot be restored. So they met and they said, okay, how, what's going to be the post-war? It was, World War II was winding down and it was uh, going to um, end soon. And so people said that, okay, after the war, we're going to have a trading system. So what's it's going to be? It cannot be the um, gold anymore. So at that point, uh, they said that let us... Uh, uh, actually, Keynes had come in with a very nice plan for international trade, but that plan was not accepted uh, because it didn't give any favor to the powerful countries. And the alternate plan that was put into effect was that, okay, some countries have gold, principally the USA, and so we will use, instead of the gold standard, what was called the gold exchange standard. So we will use currencies which can be exchanged for gold. So the countries like USA and some other so-called hard currencies promised to redeem their currencies for gold, but under uh, strict conditions. First of all, one of the things was that it was not freely. I and mean, first of all, in the USA, they banned the public from using gold or even from converting to gold. And they even banned um, any yeah, private parties could not go to the central bank and ask for gold. But the intergovernmental transactions could be done in gold. Basically, that was the thing that if uh, a country, the central bank of some country says that I have a lot of pound sterling and I want gold for that, so then the government, on a government-to-government -government basis, the uh, UK would supply gold. So all the other people, they would use pounds or dollars or... Um, and so these are the countries that could be exchanged for gold and these could be held as reserve currencies. So instead of gold, the uh, especially the um, poorer countries of the world, they used the currencies of the hard currencies and ma mainly they would use the hard currencies of their principal trading partners. So in the uh, British colonial um, era actually the pound was king but in the interwar period the dollar took over as the central currency and so all over the world basically the dollar started being used as the reserve currency. But the idea was that dollar is just a symbol of the gold that is behind it. So uh, this gave a, a, a enormous power to USA in the sense of uh, it would be able to print dollars. And when it prints dollars, it's basically printing gold. So in the Bretton Woods also, there was an agreement that the um, governments would be responsible for not printing over many dollars. But basically in the Vietnam War, the USA had an enormous amount of uh, budget deficit and they printed lots of dollars. And then General de Gaulle threatened to cash some of these dollars. And so to prevent that, uh, Nixon announced that dollar would no longer be converted for gold. And suddenly we were in the uh, free-floating era. Currencies are not tied to anything. No, So, um, in this period then, monetarism of freedmen was tried and basically uh, it failed. The basic theory of uh, Monetarism is that the money supply in the economy is a multiple of the reserves. 
This was actually introduced by Friedman. Uh, Friedman uh, restated the, basically monetarism had been discredited by Keynes, and Keynes was the dominant uh, philosopher, uh, and he, uh, his economic theory was the dominant philosophy. Uh, Keynes himself had a very uh, radical philosophy in uh, economics, which was suppressed in favor of the new classical synthesis, but even in the new classical synthesis, money has a short-term impact on the economy, but in the long run, money is neutral. Um, so, uh, and that was, the, that was all based on quantity theory, that the level of prices in the economy is a multiple of the, is just uh, proportional to the money supply, and money is uh, proportional or a multiplier of the reserves. So basically that means that the central bank controls the reserves. So this is called a theory of exogenous money. As opposed to this, there is endogenous money, which means that money is created by the private sector according to the demands of the economy. So you don't have any control over money. <coughs> <coughs> so, the Friedman rule was that since money is the multiple of reserves, if you just keep the reserves growing at a fixed amount, uh, this should be, first of all, uh, you need to make sure that money grows at least at the rate of growth of the economy. Technically, if, you, if the economy is growing at 3% and you grow the money supply at 3%, then uh, you have zero inflation and you have exactly enough money for the needs of the economy. So that would be perfect, but because of price rigidities, uh, some prices cannot go down. So if you allow inflation to happen, then what will happen is that the real price will automatically go down even though the nominal price is fixed, and so that will allow the economy to equilibrate. So a certain low amount of inflation is good for the economy. So Friedman said that keep the reserves going at 6%, the economy will go at 3%, and the inflation will be 3% also, and this will create a fixed and known rate of inflation. Uh, this was based on what we have already discussed, a misunderstanding of gains that unemployment is caused by money illusion. So this fixed growth rule will create price stability, uh, financial stability, and growth by ensuring full employment because of lack of money illusion. <coughs> so this was the idea of the Friedman rule. So Walker announced that I'm going to follow this rule for the moment. And this failed because it created the great, greatest de depression. It did bring down the inflation rate, but uh, it also caused a huge amount of uh, depression. Walker kept thinking that this is a short-run phenomena and it will wipe out, but it did not. Also, Walker could not control the money supply. <coughs> he tried to control the reserves, but the ratio <coughs> between the reserves and the actual money was very erratic. And that is because credit creation by banks is not regulated by the central bank. And uh, when the economy is booming, they create lots of money. And when it's going into free fall, they contract the money supply so, after the Friedman rule failed, there was a search for new ways to conduct monetary policy. Obviously, the Friedman method does not work. By the way, <coughs> uh, Friedman gave an interview in 2000-something, and uh, he was asked, what did we learn from the so-called monetarist experiments in the U.S. and U.K. in the start of... Uh, Walker was in 1979, he came in, and basically in early 80s, we had monetarist experiments everywhere which failed, and sort of... Um, so what did Friedman say in response to this? <coughs> <coughs> so... He, Friedman said that the monetarist experiment was in 79 when Walker announced that he was going to take the quantity of money and not the interest rate as his guide, but he didn't do it. If you look at the monetary aggregates, they were more variable during the very, uh, Walker period than any other the previous time in history. So he did not follow the monetarist course. So according to him, 
because the money supply was not growing constantly at 6%. So Walker did not follow Friedman's rule. And so um, uh, if you look at 1980-1985, you say that the aggregate monetary growth has come down and with it has come inflation. So basically he says that inflation is purely monetary and that's proven by the data. So this is a very, <coughs> <coughs> very perverse way of looking at <coughs> what happened actually. But what uh, uh, the reason to say this is that this is uh, one reason why our textbook continue to teach this uh, um, failed theory of the multiplier. I was going to give you the 2014 reference here, but again, I failed to do that. <coughs> the Bank of England has published, finally admitted that this is the, the multiplier is wrong. So, um, even though what I'm saying that the monetary experiment was a spectacular failure, uh, this is not, uh, this was something that was known to all central banks. They understood that this, that things don't happen this way. But uh, this knowledge did not make it from the uh, experience and policy to the textbooks for some reason. It was misunderstood and misinterpreted. <coughs> <coughs> So, the idea that the uh, world has confirmed the <coughs> inflation is monetary is actually exactly the opposite of what has happened in that period because over that period the, all the monetary equations failed and there was a huge amount of discussion as to why this relationship, the money demand which was stable up until the 70s has become unstable and finally because nobody could get a money demand equation to fit um, this was quietly dropped and as I said <coughs> Werner, uh, Richard Werner has an uh, alternative theory called the quantity theory of credit which says that basically if you take this credit creation by banks into account then you can make the quantity equation work and that fits in with the story that we've been saying that the reserves by themselves are not enough Reserves are used to do credit creation and credit creation is a very important part of the story. And if you take that into account, then you can make the uh, um, quantity equation work. Also, you have to take into account the prices of stocks and the prices of land. Uh, this is omitted from the standard, the consumer price level does not include the stock prices and does not include land prices usually. So. <coughs> So that's why the inflation index doesn't capture all of the places where the money is going and the money quantity does not capture all of the places where the money is being created. So uh, once you take both of those into account, then you can get back into the quantity equation fit, which is not available otherwise. So, <coughs> so once it became clear that <coughs> the... Uh, Friedman rule doesn't work, then there was a search all over the banks for a way to do monetary, alternative method to do monetary policy. And uh, basically Roger Douglas uh, was Minister of Finance and he uh, said to the New, Zo New Zealand Central Bank that he wanted the inflation, uh, inflation to be brought down to between 0 and 2%. Now, the New Zealand Bank was actually quite happy because they had brought it down from 16% to 5% and that was a, a good accomplishment, but um, Roger Douglas said that, no, that's not good enough. And uh, so, New Zealand said, okay, let's see what we can do and they created this idea of inflation targeting that, okay, we want the inflation 2%, how can we do it? They succeeded uh, by using... Um, the discount rate, actually the interest rate was in widespread use all over because it became clear 
that uh, the interest rate is not uh, enough. Uh, sorry, the money, the reserves are not enough. But uh, uh, still, the goal seemed to be to control the money supply. That is, the banks said, uh, you were trying to achieve uh, monetary targets that let the money increase at 6% as per Friedman rule. So the New Zealand said, why control the money? So why not control directly the goal? The object is the inflation rate. So instead of controlling the money supply in order to control the money inflation rate, which is what Friedman says, which doesn't work, let's directly go for inflation targeting. <coughs> <clears throat> and so uh, they managed to succeed in uh, bringing the rate and that made clear to everybody that this is a goal which can be pursued and which works. Of course, the MMT pro idea is that even if you can announce it, even if you can make it work by crippling the economy, that doesn't mean it's a good thing. That's because you can announce an inflation target and achieve it. Doesn't necessarily... And, and, to achieve it, uh, if you have uh, output losses and employment losses, and so this is not a good idea. <coughs> Once in inflation targeting became um, the uh, sort of the standard, then um, then this question of operational independence for the central ba bank became important. <coughs> there are many reasons why um, independence of central bank is just impossible because uh, central bank provides money to the government uh, it has their monetary policy fiscal policy has to be coordinated uh, many decisions of the government have to be supported by the central bank but um, um, if the central bank is seen as a part of the government, then there is no credi uh, credibility for inflation targeting. <coughs> and one thing that was realized <coughs> over the decade of the 80s was that public expectations are very important and uh, one has to manage these expectations. So if the central bank is not independent, then the Minister of Finance has a lot of pressure on him, especially prior to elections, there is always a demand for lots of spending and that will lead to inflation. Um, also, the national debt is very high and payments on the national debt depend on the interest rate and so there is a pressure on the Minister of Finance to keep the interest low that will give him <coughs> more fiscal space. So, um, central bank operations in uh, public sector debt and in setting the rate have a direct impact on the fiscal space of the government. So, if you have a uh, central bank under control of the treasury, then they will have this conflict of interest. So, what uh, to do something for the which is good for the inflation, might be harmful to the budget balance of the, uh, of the government itself. So, um, uh, so, if you want to use inflation targeting, then you have to have operational independence because otherwise the bank will not be able to announce credible targets. <clears throat> now, when financial deregulation took place in the 1980s, um, then one thing that happened was that uh, banks started issuing more and more credit. And so, the capital ratio declined by a lot, which means that basically what is the backing that you have for the credit that you are extending. So, uh, in the regulated times, uh, the ratios were quite high because they were kept high by law, <coughs> but once you dere deregulated the banks, the banks started to issue credit with very little backing and that 
obviously led to more and more crises because uh, if you have small amount of reserves and large amount of obligations then any time that a lot of obligations are uh, coming in uh, then you enter into a banking crisis so as we saw that there were no banking crises over uh, until the Nixon shock but after the 70s 80s 90s we have had lots of banking crises and increasing number there was a IMF paper listing more than 300 banking crises so you have to actually define exactly what a crisis is and there are many ways and many ways to count but basically you can show that as deregulation has increased the number of crises have also increased so there was one big crisis MAB Mexico Argentina and Brazil uh, <clears throat> in which there were uh, major defaults on these sovereign debts and um, that led to the realization that we need to have some rules and especially rules for international lending because these crises these would occur in uh, um, across countries and would have effect across borders and the uh, Mexico crisis led to the savings and loan crisis in uh, in uh, USA because a lot of USA banks uh, uh, the savings loan uh, had deposited money in Mexico to earn high interest and so when Mexican debt collapsed there was a so there was the Basel Accord of 1988 that was the first meeting of the international bankers and they set up some capital requirements that <coughs> at least you have to have so much capital in order to make loans and many and many other rules and regulations so this was an attempt by banks to self-regulate this was the standard Friedmanian theory in operation that instead of government regulations what we need is that the, the private sector has incentive to self-regulate to make sure that it doesn't go into crisis. <coughs> uh, since then this was not this didn't prove very successful there have been a lot of more crises and accordingly this agreement has been re re revised to Basel 2 and Basel 3 and I think they're going for Basel 4 <coughs> in the near future but um, self-regulation doesn't seem to work for uh, obvious reasons uh, reasons which are obvious to those who have studied Minsky so from 1988 after Basel 1 to 2007 uh, the central banks were in self-congratulation mode. They said that we have now solved the problems. Inflation is under control, as Friedman said, and that was the main problem. So we have price stability. Because of price stability, we are having a uh, uh, natural rate of unemployment. So yes, it's high, but that's what the economy is supposed to be like. Uh, we have the great moderation. Business cycles have been tamed. And Lucas said that we have learned to prevent recessions. It all came apart in the global financial crisis of 2007. <clears throat> Bernanke said that we know how the Great Depression happened. He, said, he was speaking in absentia to Friedman and said we won't let it happen again because we know the reason. And so he did follow his master's voice and uh, injected trillions of dollars into the system basically Friedman's diagnosis was that the Great, uh, the great Depression happened because of insufficient liquidity so liquidity was there but unfortunately it didn't work the Great Recession happened anyway so basically all of the central monetarist positions were uh, rejected by the experience although macroeconomists still haven't learnt this lesson just like we have discussed so now <clears throat> what is supposed to happen after the global financial crisis, what should we be doing? There's a lot of um, disturbance in central banks. It's clear that basically one of the things and, and uh, uh, I think the article that I read said that 
Now central banks have become philosophers. Previously they were just short-term managers. Now they are thinking what's our role in life, what's our goal and purpose. <coughs> but it's clear that short-term management is not enough. If you just prevent, uh, make sure that the stock markets don't decline tomorrow, which is the Greenspan put, and let the private sector self-regulate. Just make sure that no crisis happens today. So uh, first, one thing we saw that, that price stability does not guarantee financial stability. The, self, uh, the, the private sector can blow up even though inflation is uh, under control and there's the great moderation. All prices are predictable. So the idea was that when you have a predictable economy, <clears throat> then the private sector, the only the problems that arise in the private sector management come from uh, unpredictability and unpredictability comes from these shocks and these shocks also include government policy shocks. <clears throat> so the whole source of the pro problem is outside, inside the system is stable. So we saw that the <clears throat> all the outside shocks were not there but the private sector by itself blew up the economy and that's exactly the Minskyan theory. So now everybody understands that there is need to manage the long term risks to the system and uh, perhaps uh, inflation targeting is not the goal, although the current consensus is that inflation targeting is fine, that's what's needed, but we also need what is called macro prudential regulation. We need to have basically more of the Basel Accord. We need to make sure that the banks don't misbehave so that crises don't happen. But otherwise, um, inflation targeting is the right goal. <laughs> So modern monetary theory offers solutions but rather different from what the mainstream macro is. <coughs> By the way, I gave a talk on the basis of these ideas at the State Bank on Thursday. So uh, I said that, you know, after teaching this course, I changed my mind about these because at the beginning I was a skeptic. I was just um, studying MMT to understand what it is without having, in fact, I wasn't sure. I, I thought that it had some good things and some bad things mixed in it, but now I've become a convert. I think that this is a good um, approach. <coughs> So what are the solutions that modern monetary theory offers us? Well, the key thing, especially I was talking at the central bank, so I tried to isolate those things which would be easily understood by people who are generally hostile to the idea. So I didn't focus on the idea that uh, government deficits equals uh, private surplus, which is actually the central idea and very important. but. That is really exactly the opposite of what is thought. So you don't want to, um, when you want to change ideas, you don't want to attack at the heart. And you want to uh, chip at the periphery where you won't meet such strong resistance. <clears throat> so the most important idea is, you, is that the uh, mm, deficit hawks don't want to spend too much money. So uh, that's... That's the operational implication of the idea that deficits don't matter. So uh, that uh, case can be made separately and logically and cleanly. So I, uh, I focused on this as a strategy and I'm telling you this because you will also need to use strategy if you want to discuss MMT in uh, hostile environments and today actually uh, environment is very hostile. There's a big debate taking place on MMT. Um, and uh, I think that uh, Stephanie Kelton, who is a major mmt -er, is advisor to Bernie Sanders, and so the debate is taking place precisely because there is some danger that if they come into power, they will implement these policies. So a lot of big, big names have taken <coughs> pot shots at MMT. <coughs> so, okay, so here is where we say that, okay, Suppose that government has balanced budget or some level of deficit. Now we spend some more money. So what's the, the standard theory which uh, comes from the supply side perspective? 
that the amount of output is fixed and so when you uh, spend more money by deficit spending then uh, inflation will happen <clears throat> but suppose you spend money on a project which creates more output suppose you hire people and you uh, have them uh, plant uh, trees then um, these trees can be fast growing and they can be harvested and that will create um, create wood so it creates output so if you have more money and more output then you can't say that it's inflationary if you look at the equation mv <coughs> equals pq the idea is the velocity and quantity is fixed so if money goes up then prices must go up but suppose that as money goes up quantity also goes up then there is no implication for prices so the real business cycle thinking is this, uh, this is called the classic, classical dichotomy that the real sector is divorced from the uh, monetary sector so what happens in the monetary sector is just that it affects the prices and in the real sector uh, things are separate money is a veil if you increase the money you can't increase output this is what prevents uh, uh, classical economists from thinking along the lines that I'm saying and why because you're automatically at full employment full employment so there are no unemployed resources what i'm saying is that let's print some money and give it to the unemployed and uh, make them produce something now this is all of this is inconceivable in the classical and new classical framework because everything is already fully employed so you're already at full output so the quantity cannot increase so this is exactly what keynes said in the general theory that the classical theory is a special theory which applies to the case of full employment em economies and his general theory applies to case where you have unemployment and employment <clears throat> so there are these projects which self finance in the sense that you spend money on them then they create output and the output pays back for the money that you spent so this is this is a practical implication so the basically the idea is that in pakistan we have millions of people who are unemployed so um accord, uh, so there is a huge output gap the if these people could be employed so the question arises okay let's give them all jobs so the question arises where will the money come from so we say that well you see the government issues an iou mm -hmm. and uh, we Uh, print money on the base strength of this IOU and we give this in jobs and when they earn money when, when they produce output uh, this will pay back the loan this is actually to convince the uh, hawks the deficit hawks is so not necessarily the correct line of argument in fact the correct line of argument comes from your model where these people do nothing but the printing of the deficit money leads to raised aggregate demand and that also leads leads to increased aggregate output which also pays back for the money so it's it's a it's a strange mechanism it doesn't it does it's not obvious um, i mean the obvious mechanism job guarantee is that you give money to people and they work and they they produce more output but actually they they buy when they spend uh, money that raises the aggregate demand and when you raise the aggregate demand then the producers produce more and so uh, the money ends up leading to additional output but not in the way that one might think so the key recommendation which comes out of the mmt framework is that we should use unemployed resources to add to output and we can print money to do whatever uh, is necessary we don't we are not constrained by uh, lack of money so this is the main thing that the fiscal uh, people all over asad umar uh, waqar masood and everybody else says that there is no fiscal space our budget is uh, we have a, a, a revenue which comes from to the government and now we are spending so much on interest and so much on army and there is very little money left for us to do developmental projects so this argument is wrong because you can print more money and so people say well if you print more money then that will lead to inflation 
We say, no, you print the money in a smart way. We print money in such a way that it leads to more jobs for more people and that will create more output. So if you have more output, then you can't say that you have more inflation. But in order for this to work, they have to be, you have to make sure that the people that you hire actually add to output. So in the steel will, it is said that it was got destroyed because the popular government gave jobs to everybody uh, and they didn't have to do any work they just showed up to get the money so if you if you do um, that then you might create inflation um, what you need to do uh, is to create productive jobs so once you do that it's possible to create massive uh, increase unemployment without the concern that deficit will rise. Most important among these tasks is to build infrastructure, roads, houses, lay grid lines. How did Dubai develop? By using our unemployed laborers who have no skills. We can do exactly the same thing in Pakistan. We can, uh, we don't have money, people say, but actually we need we need to build million houses, we need to build roads, we need to, and all of this can easily be done by unemployed, uh, unskilled labor. We need to give them a small amount of training and then they can. So all of these jobs are there, all of these laborers are there, and why it's not happening? Because we don't have money. This is a silly um, uh, macro theory, but this is widely believed. In addition to these, there are today green jobs, planting trees, uh, retrofitting houses. We have all of these geysers outside the house uh, which are uh, uh, very cold and all you need to do is to cover them up to make sure that uh, they are insulated so that um, the you don't spend uh, um, heat to uh, heat up the atmosphere and then these pipes are running outside the houses and so they are ice cold and so the first thing that happens is that these ice cold pipes become uh, hot and if you run the pipes properly through the inside of the house they will not get so cold there are many, many things that you could do so basically any re retrofitting to make the houses more energy efficient is something which is done being done in switzerland and it can also be done here so there are all of these jobs that are available which are productive which will save the and so, uh, just uh, financing this job, training people to do these jobs and getting them to do is a is a win-win proposition. It will uh, massively improve the economy, but there is no fiscal place to do this. <laughs> so now, actually, that's the big picture, but to actually implement this requires a lot of detailed work. So suppose I give, uh, I, I pump trillion rupees into the economy by providing jobs to millions of people and uh, la la launching enterprises and many other things that can be done. Uh, so what will happen? You need to do the calculations. Uh, who will get the money and then what will they demand? Uh, so one of the things that they will demand is food. So you want to make sure that some of this labor is going into the agriculture. So they should be able to plant foods. There are many projects like people uh, have done, like in cities, they ask uh, people to uh, give part of their land. Um, people have large lawns uh, to produce uh, to, to produce vegetables. So people come from the outside, plant vegetables, and take them. I was in my um, neighborhood. There was some Chinese people who. Um, rented a house and in front of the house you have a very small square plot of land and they grew enormous amount of vegetables of strange types in very small space because apparently they have they, they know how to do this in China so you can grow a lot of, so basically uh, it's easy to do to create more food so one of the that will be one of them but what you need is actually what is called input output tables. If you produce uh, one uh, ton of steel, uh, this 
feeds into some sectors of the economy and it requires some inputs from some other sectors. So basically when you pump money into a sector, you have to see what are the linkages with the other sectors. What, where will this money go? So this money will go into demands for certain types of goods and it will also create supplies. So this will unbalance your economy. Now you need to make sure that uh, you can take care of these uh, things. So, uh, um, so you have to anticipate the demands. That requires basically um, detailed knowledge. Detailed knowledge of the linkages of the economy. Um, what we have seen from Minsky is that in order to stabilize the economy, you need a big government. So what's go going on here is that actually Russian economy, the command economy was working like this. They, they had these they had these plans and they had these input output tables and they said, okay, we are going to produce so much steel and so much uh, cotton, so much uh, um, corn and so on. All of the things that were determined by the state. And it collapsed because the state did not have the <coughs> right uh, uh, level of uh, knowledge and information about the demands in the economy. So it was decided correctly that they should move towards private sector methods of production because that creates the right incentives. But actually what is needed is a mix. Uh, yani if Suppose you want to uh, create a million jobs. The government simply does not have the capacity to do so. It can um, say, okay, everybody, uh, we will hire everybody in the steel mill, but it will not be able to put them to work. It doesn't, doesn't it? So what you need is uh, private-public partnership. You uh, can't get rid of the government. The government will finance and can't get rid of the private sector either. And the government has to uh, collaborate. There are, you have to look at where in the private sector there is excess capacity. If there is none, as the people say, then you have to look at where you can build capacity. And all of this can be done, provided that you have the right mindset. The problem is that uh, people don't have the right mindset. What the mindset is that first we must get growth. When we have growth, then we have lots of money. When we have lots of money, then we will hire the people and we'll feed the people. So this is exactly the opposite of what is needed. And with this mindset, you can never get anywhere. And the basic obstacle and the problem in the path of uh, doing all of this is political. If you give jobs to all the people, if you have prosperity, the power will shift dramatically. Today, actually, I mean, uh, it's very much I mean, in a drawing room conversation, people were talking about educating the uh, poor. So uh, one of the ladies said that, where will we get our servants if everybody gets educated? <laughs> so this is, I mean, this, this was a serious concern. So this is, this is true that uh, uh, there are no private servants except for millionaires in the USA. Mm -hmm. If everybody, uh, if everybody is educated, everybody has jobs, then uh, the upper class will suffer. They will have to make their own chai. Now, it's very interesting that Saud came and gave me the chai. <laughs> Normally, it would be a naib khasid. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, 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 uh, I have been trying to get rid of naib khasid, but nobody agrees because they say that <laughs> who, will be, who will make our chai? <laughs> so, we say we can put in a Nestle um, machine to, um, to uh, and everybody can go and, and uh, that's how we, uh, in, when I was in the US, we, every, there was a coffee machine and you go to the coffee machine, you put in your styrofoam cup and you make your own coffee. It doesn't take any effort, but uh, people are... Um. So, um, this uh, kind of... Now the problem is, I mean, this is a joke, but the problem is the political the one, that there is an elite upper class, they have power. Um, if you um, devolve power, this is why all efforts at devolution have failed. Uh, many people have realized it and there have been many, uh, many efforts. And so this devolution is meaningless. The 
going from federal to province doesn't mean anything. Devolving power to the people means that you go to the communities and you give them budgets and you give them their own projects and you let them do things. So, um, today you, you get lots of multi-million rupee projects which fail <coughs> we, we, at the planning commission and the main reason for failure is that there is no ownership. Who writes up the project? It's the secretary of the or the uh, bureaucrat, they say, okay, this place needs a hospital, so we have a hospital project. But, you see, the project needs to be uh, driven by the community. The, if there is a community, uh, they say that, okay, we want a hospital, okay, and they should go and uh, design the project, and they run the project, then it will be successful, and it will be very, and there will be ownership, there will be people who, who want to make it work, and they will try to get around the obstacles. So this kind of thing uh, requires public-private partnerships. The community doesn't have the money to carry out big projects. The government has the money but not the uh, skills nor the incentives. So uh, this is what is needed.